The Middle East tops the agenda at the UN General Assembly. African American history is honored at the latest museum to open in the nation's capital. And a countdown of the continent's top five music hits. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCory. This is Africa 54. We begin in New York, where world leaders have been addressing the United Nations General Assembly all week. Issues confronting the Middle East dominated Thursday's UNGA debate. VOA's Margaret Bashir has more from the United Nations. In July of last year, six world powers and Iran agreed to a deal to curb Iran's nuclear program. At the UN, Iran's president urged the United States to step up implementation of its obligations under the agreement, which is known as the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Compliance with the JCPOA on the part of the United States in the past several months represents a flawed approach that should be rectified forthwith. In part, Tehran has been frustrated that foreign banks have shied away from dealing with the country. Later at a news conference, Rouhani criticized a proposal by U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry to ground all warplanes in Syria in order to get humanitarian aid in and rebuild confidence among the many actors. We must all focus on getting this aid to those who need it, which has nothing to do with flights, grounding flights. If you ground flights, you are aiding the terrorists, whether you like it or not. Rouhani said the terrorists are well equipped and only lack aircraft. So if Syrian and international warplanes are grounded, it would help the terrorists. On the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas warned that Israel's continued settlement expansion is jeopardizing any chance of a two-state solution. <laughs> The settlements are illegal in every aspect and any manifestation. We will therefore continue to exert all efforts for the adoption of a Security Council resolution on the settlements, and we hope that no one will cast a veto. But Israel's leader was defiant. Given its history of hostility towards the UN, or towards Israel rather, does anyone really believe that Israel will let the UN determine our security and our vital national interests? We will not accept any attempt by the UN to dictate terms to Israel. Meanwhile, Iraq's leader said his government is making progress in its battle with the self-proclaimed Islamic State. A year ago, I stood here as there was large areas of the Iraq of Iraq's territory was occupied by the terrorist organization Daesh, ISIL. Today, we stand again at the same place to declare before you that Iraq is being liberated and that Iraqis have been able to liberate most of their land and towns thanks to their unity and determination. A major offensive to liberate the northern city of Mosul from the terrorists is expected in the coming months. Well, now for the latest from the UN General Assembly via his United Nations correspondent, uh, Margaret Bashir joins us live from New York. Margaret, these issues have been discussed in different forums uh, for the past year. Uh, has discussing them at, at the UNGA given a kind of a promise of uh, progress here? Well, I tell you, Vincent, the really the toughest issue they've been dealing with this week is Syria trying to salvage this cessation of hostilities there. U.S. and Russia talking about it, but the, it's just not going well. Uh, we saw both the U.S. Uh, Secretary of State John Kerry and uh, Sergei Lavrov, his Russian counterpart, this morning. Uh, no progress so far today. Uh, we're expecting Mr. Lavrov to give his speech in the General Assembly in about 15 minutes. We'll see if he gives any indications. He's also supposed, to, also supposed to meet with the media today, so perhaps we'll have a bit better indication of where things stand. But it's really proving a, a difficult uh, impasse for the two sides to get through to really kind of revive this uh, failing ceasefire. 
And now we know there have been all sorts of leaders, too many leaders there. What are the other issues that may have grabbed people's attention around the UNGA? Well, I'll tell you one that I was surprised didn't grab their attention, and that was the, that is the war in Yemen. Uh, there's been so much talk about Syria, but in Yemen, 10,000 people have died. Uh, there was a very serious airstrike, a Saudi-led airstrike on Wednesday. Uh, several dozen people were killed. Uh, half the country is on the verge of famine, and yet we really haven't heard too much about it here at this uh, General Assembly. Uh, today, though, Africa's issues did get some attention. There was a high-level meeting on Mali, another one on the Central African Republic, a uh, humanitarian meeting on the, the Lake Chad region. So Africa is getting a, a, some attention today at the, at the UN. And uh, as the you know, UNGA NGA, uh, kind of concludes in the coming days, what can we expect? Quickly. Uh, lots of talk. We'll see if it, if it uh, materializes into any changes on the ground for any of the world's crises. Well, we we'll watch and see, Margaret. Thank you very much, always, uh, for being there for us. That thank is you, uh, Voice of America's United Nations correspondent, Margaret Bashir, reporting live from New York. Now, more than 130 bodies have been recovered by Friday from a boat carrying hundreds of migrants that capsized off Egypt two days earlier. Now, the boat sank off Burj Rashid, that's a coastal village on the Nile Delta. Earlier, rescue workers and fishermen claimed they had rescued at least 169 people. However, a health ministry spokesman said 133 bodies had been retrieved from the Mediterranean, while the governor of the Bahira region, where the boat sank, put the number at 148. Uh, now, security sources said there had been almost... Uh, Three, 600 migrants aboard the boat. Officials say they believe the Egyptian, Sudanese, Euro Eritrean and Somali migrants were heading to Italy. The International Organization for Migration says that more than 3,200 migrants have died while attempting to cross the Mediterranean this year, while nearly 300,000 have reached Europe safely. Now, tensions have risen in Gabon's capital, Libreville, ahead of an expected decision by the Constitutional Court about the legitimacy of the disputed presidential election results. On Thursday, President Ali Bongo and opposition leader Jean Ping's lawyers met in the Constitutional Court before the decision by the court, which is due Friday. Previously, violence and riots had erupted in Libreville after protests uh, following the disputed August 27 election handed victory to President Ali Bongo, enabling him to extend his family's half-century in power. Now, Bongo's rival for the presidency, Jinping, denounced the results as fraudulent. Ordinary Gabonese uh, people fear the court will hand the election to Bongo and that this will lead to more violence. Now, hundreds of demonstrators uh, defied a midnight curfew in Charlotte, North Carolina, in the eastern United States, marching peacefully in the early hours of Friday morning against the police shooting of an African-American man. Authorities say they have no plans to enforce the curfew as long as the protests remain peaceful. Television video showed some protesters shaking hands with the National Guard personnel early Friday. Thursday night, large crowds of demonstrators marched through the heart of Charlotte, the state's largest city, in the third night of protests. While generally peaceful, a tear gas was used against demonstrators at one location. Police and riot gear were dispersed uh, throughout the city. Now, the officers were armed with rubber bullets and tear gas. Governor Pat McGurry, a former mayor of Charlotte, already has declared a state of emergency. He said police would arrest lawbreakers. Now, the protests were sparked by the shooting of Keith Lamont Scott as he got out of his car on Tuesday. Police said Scott was holding a gun when they shot him, but his family said Scott was unharmed. Now, for the latest uh, viewers, uh, Giselle Tobias joins me live from Charlotte. Uh, good evening, Giselle. Now, first, uh, can you tell us what the mood is like? Yeah, give us a sense of the mood in that city today. Today, uh, we have a very calm mood. Uh, we don't see not many protesters right now on the street. We see some business coming back uh, to be open again, coming back to business. Uh, most of the, those businesses were closed yesterday, but today looks like the city wants to come back to normality, if we can call it that way. Uh, so that's pr pretty much the mood right now. We saw it yesterday, as you mentioned it, a lot of protesters 
officers on the street, but we had a peaceful demonstration. What could let us to, to understand that these people is trying to do things differently, in a different way, and, for, and try to forget about what happened just two nights ago. Now, we know that there has been uh, some dispute over the video that uh, was shot at the time that the gentleman uh, was killed in, um, in the, in, in, on the streets there. What has been the reaction by people in Charlotte over this particular video? I just talked with a few of them right now and exactly where um, Keith Scott was killed and shot by a police officer here in Charlotte. That's exactly the place where he was killed. Well, I was talking with a couple of people about the topic and they were saying that they want to see the video. They just want to make sure Scott didn't have a gun. That's what they are saying, that Mr. Scott didn't have a gun and didn't point that gun to the officials and they want to see the video. They said if the police show them the video and the video proves that Scott did actually actually um, pointed the, his gun to the police or had a gun with him, then they will just go back home and will uh, understand why the officer killed Mr. Scott. But obviously the police just say minutes ago that they're not going to release the video right now and they're asking to, to the population to be patient. But they said they will show the family, right? Correct. Okay. They, they'll try, to, yes, to find some middle ground and they're going to, of course, this is an ongoing investigation and uh, we'll see what uh, the police says in the next days. Well, Giselle, thank you very much for joining us today. That's viewers Giselle Tobias reporting live from Charlotte in North Carolina. Now, we want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. And check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Coming up, inside the new National Museum of African American History and Culture. Stay with us. I'm Milar Sega. I'm the host of VOA's The Correspondence, a roundup of the world's top stories with analysis from our dedicated reporters. It's really a conversation the same way that you would bring a friend to your home and ask them what's going on. In our correspondence, we'll do that and answer those questions through their own eyes. That appears a false choice in more ways than one. We can't actually put you there, but we can come pretty close. In 30 minutes, we'll show you the world. Well, the National Museum of African American History and Culture opened Saturday. What started as a legislation under then President George W. Bush will soon be the latest addition to the Smithsonian's complex of, uh, complex of museums on the National Mall in Washington. VOA got a preview of the massive museum. Arash Arabasadi has this report. What we want is a museum that uses the past to help you understand the world you're living in. That is the goal of the new Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture. This is your story, regardless of who you are. That this is the story that tells you about your own family, your own family's struggle of freedom or citizenship. It reshuffles the deck of American history. It's, a, it's revolutionary. The story starts with the global slave trade that forcibly brought Africans on a long, grueling journey to America. We built the country. And, and we were enslaved for 246 years, which means that we were enslaved longer than we have been free. Highlighted is this early 1800s slave shack. It would have been pretty unbearable living within this cabin. If you've ever been down to the South Carolina low country, you'll know that it's very heavy with mosquitoes and bugs. It's very hot. When we collected the cabin, snakes came out of the cabin. There are reminders of the Jim Crow laws in southern U.S. states that effectively enforced racial segregation by promoting the notion of separate but equal, which was anything but equal if you were black. If you were white, you walked into, you bought your ticket, you walked into this rail car and you sat in the white section. 
The white section was a lot nicer than the black section. Ah! Exhibits weave the story through the civil rights era of the 1960s. And there are entire sections dedicated to entertainment and to sports, where participants of all races, when they were finally allowed to compete, were equal. Whenever the playing field is even, and the rules are public, the goals are clear, referees are fat, and the score is transparent, we can make it. But the struggle for civil rights is not limited to just African Americans. African Americans paved the way through their strategies right. to assist other groups seeking equality. The finishing touches are almost done. Doors open September 24th, led fittingly by America's first black president. Arashir Arbasadi, VOA News, Washington. When our Freedom Sounds Festival on the grounds of the Washington Monument kicks off three days of celebrations around the official opening of the museum. To catch the excitement, we're joined live by VOA's Haiti Adams Fitzpatrick, who is in the midst of the action on the grounds of the Washington Monument. Now, Haiti, the museum is opening to much fanfare. Tell us what we can expect to see today and for the rest of the weekend. Vincent, organizers here say the significance of this museum will make this an unprecedented local, national and international event, unlike the opening of any other cultural institution in the world in recent memory. And as you mentioned, this festival will run until Sunday tomorrow, of course, being the opening, the main event. And just looking at what's on the lineup, there'll be dance, poetry, visual arts, music, everything from hip hop to funk, folk music, um, blues and gospel. And just taking a look at all the acts that are lined up, Public Enemy, Roots, Living Color, Beninese Grammy Award winner Angelique Kijo. Also, we're expecting a slew of celebrities to make their way through here. Oprah Winfrey, for one, she has been this museum's biggest donor. There'll be Michael Jordan, um, Tyler Perry, and Denzel Washington, who, along with his wife, raised $17 million for this museum. President Barack Obama will, of course, tomorrow um, make a speech at the dedication ceremony. And in terms of the scope and size of this event, people are already comparing it to Barack Obama's 2009 inauguration speech. So even with the crowds, with the long lines, the tight security, I guess people are willing to bear it all because after all, they're here to celebrate. Vincent, the magnitude of the moment not lost on anyone here. Well, we can expect that. Now, Heidi, you know, you've been speaking to people around there. What are they telling you uh, that this symbolizes for them and what it really means to them personally? Well, Vincent, when we arrived here, we started speaking to a few people who have, of course, come out just to take some pictures of the museum. Some of them telling us, you know, this is really an important step forward in the history of America. Others just expressing their sense of pride and accomplishment to just be able to stand here and look at this building. You know, millions of people come here to the United States, to Washington, to see these museums. For school students here in America, it's almost a rite of passage to come to see the Capitol, to see the White House, and then the Smithsonian. Museums, And so many people here will tell you that this building is the one piece that has been missing from Museum Row for so long. Uh, a place that really honors the contributions of Americans of African descent, not just those who came here as slaves, but also those who came here in freedom. A place that chronicles also their hardships over time. And the founding director of this museum said something so profound. He said, not just to Americans, but to people all over the world, if you think that this is not your story, then it is. So in a way, this is America telling the world, telling itself and its children that this is what this country represents, this is what it stands for, and now this building completes finally um, a piece of that picture. Now, in a few words, we know that in the coming days and weeks people visit, it is free to get in, but is it going to be that easy, really? I'm so sorry to be the bearer of bad news. Of course, you can imagine many people have been clamoring to get access to this building, but reservations have been booked all the way through the end of October. So the museum, however, if you go onto its website, you can get a timed pass for November and December. But if you are planning to come here, plan accordingly. It's not going to be as easy as just walking through the doors. Aidy, thank you very much. 
Now that's uh, viewers Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick reporting live from the grounds of uh, the Washington Monument in Washington, D.C. And it's time now for a short break still to come on Africa 54. Counting down the continent's hottest heats. We'll be right back. You've just joined us. I'm Mariama Diallo, and here is a quick recap of today's headline. In Gabon, the Constitutional Court will conduct a recount of ballots cast in the disputed presidential election that's following days of violent protests. Parents are leaving their children behind in drought stricken Zimbabwe to find employment in neighboring countries. In Nigeria, inspectors track down 700,000 firms that have never paid taxes in an attempt to find alternative sources of income for its first recession in more than 20 years. In Egypt, a new play in Cairo starring deaf and hearing impaired actors draws crowd to the Egyptian theater scene. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Welcome back to Africa 54, and now here's what's trending. Now, Facebook chief executive Mark Zuckerberg and his wife Priscilla Chan have pledged more than $3 billion towards a plan to cure, prevent, or even manage all diseases within our children's lifetime. Investments will include a bioscience research center called the BioHub and plans for a chip to diagnose disease, a continuous bloodstream monitoring, and a map of cell types in the body. Now, Chan and Zuckerberg would donate $600 million over the next decade to the BioHub Research Center. An initial project will be infectious disease initiative to develop new tools, tests, and vaccines and strategies for fighting research uh, diseases such as HIV, Ebola, and Zika. Well, next up, uh, Cuba's growing upper middle class has a thing for fancy dogs and is spending big sums of, uh, to pamper them. Now, dozens of dogs, salons, boutiques, and pure bread poppy sellers have cropped up across Havana. A handful of, of organizations work to spay and neuter street dogs and find homes for their paps. But Cubans with means uh, prefer to spend between 100 and 300 US dollars on pure bread puppies. In a country where cars and new homes are out of reach for most, a purebred dog is a status symbol that offers a return on investment in the form of future puppies to sell. That's cute. Well, and finally, a police in India's central Mutia Pradesh state have come out with a novel idea by asking women to click selfies with them and use them as profile pictures on social media to deter stalkers. Now, the central Indian state reported the highest number of rape cases and the most cases of assaults on women in the last decade, as according to data released by the National Crime Records Bureau. India has enacted tougher sentences for sexual offenders and promises to try the accused through fast-track courts, uh, but rape, acid attacks and domestic violence remain common. And that is what's trending today. Welcome back, it's music time, and today we give you five top music videos from Africa. Here's Son of Sea Diallo. Welcome to VOA's African Hit. I'm Son of Sea Diallo, your host. We are starting our musical countdown today in the world's largest producer of cocoa, Ivory Costa, with the duo Tour de Garde and Shake It. Now we are selling to the pearl of Africa in Uganda with Eddie Kenzo in Disco Disco. Boom. 
Number three, his music is a precursor of Afro trap, mixed with African music and a trap music. He is on number three of the day, MHD in Akelenta. Les années sont passées, certains nous ont lâchés. On se promit d'être soudés jusqu'au bout. Tu l'as choisi, vous deux, c'est l'amour fou. Tu connais sa famille, elle connaît la tienne. Dans les moments durs, elle partage ta peine. N'est pas d'inquiétude, t'es sa première et dernière. Accroche-toi, le bonheur t'appelle. Ah, ce soir, c'est ton jour, la noce fait démarrer. On est tous dans la foule. Our number two is a multiple award winner, South African hip hop recording artist, Aka in one time. Baby, don't waste no time. Money stay on your mind. Nobody gon' kill your back. Go ahead and lift your life. I'm feeling like, whoa, all right. Cause I ain't leaving on my own tonight. Hey, one time for the gold diggers. One time for the blessers. Making her first entry with her new release, Bad, here's Tiwa Savage featuring Whiskey. Let's go. I go to say, oh, oh. trouble you don't like me unfollow you can't talk about my hustle you make money i make double turn me up turn me louder louder from the streets to the zanga zanga take a shot like a soldier soldier now you find me one you feel me share it oh no you cannot go me my way i'm far And that's all for today. Make sure to check our social media pages at VOA's African Hit. The African Musical Countdown, it's on VOA African Hit. Once again, thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. And that's it. Have a good night. Yeah. Welcome to the Voice of America's News Words. Does this word mean something good has happened? Unleashed. The President is sending Secretary of State John Kerry to the Middle East to help build a coalition to defeat the militants who have unleashed a wave of violence that has included attacks on Iraq's Christians and other minority communities, and recently the videotape killing of American journalist James Foley. Unleashed means to let something very powerful happen quickly. It is like taking a leash off a dog and letting it attack someone. In our story, the militants unleashed or set off a wave of violence. Usually, unleashed does not mean something good. So, the next time you hear the word unleashed, you will know what this news word means.